So after intense muscle activity, our muscles have to return to normal. Um, that lactate that diffuses into the bloodstream goes to the liver, and the liver will convert it back to pyruvate and then finally back to glucose. Um, and that glucose can go into the bloodstream and rebuild the glycogen reserves in the muscle. This conversion of the lactate back to glucose is called the Cori cycle. Oxygen is required to restore us to normal conditions, and this is called oxygen debt. And after very intense exercise, it may be days before our muscles return to the previous prior to exercise resting state. This is showing the Cori cycle where the lactate, after intense act, after activity, and we produce lactate anaerobically, the lactate enters the bloodstream, goes back to the liver, is converted back to glucose in the Cori cycle. And that glucose can go in the bloodstream and go back to the muscle for storage or be used for energy. Which of the following can be used as fuel to make ATP in the absence of oxygen? Glycogen. Hypertrophy is when we overwork our muscles. Repeated exhaustive stimulation. So you can imagine that people who are using the machines at the gym, that's exactly what they're doing to their muscle fibers. Repeated exhaustive stimulation. And this causes the muscle fibers to develop more mitochondria, more enzymes, more reserves, more myofibrils. It enlarges the whole muscle, which is called hypertrophy, and you get stronger. He's happy. Yeah, he's not going to be that happy when he's 85 years old and has quit uh, doing the weightlifting and all that muscle will convert to fat. Lack of stimulation to skeletal muscles causes atrophy. And this can be um, natural with aging. Our, if we don't work our muscles, they will get weaker. Um, it can happen if you're, if you ever had a cast on an arm or a leg, the muscles get smaller, and then um, some diseases can cause atrophy. Other conditions that can affect our muscles, polio. Polio in the 50s was catastrophic for many, many children. It's a virus that attacks the motor neurons, causing muscle atrophy and paralysis. So that's a problem with the, the neural signal. Tetanus is caused by Clostridium tetani, which is bacteria that live in uh, soils everywhere. It's just everywhere. And they produce spores that can enter our body, say a deep puncture wound. And if the spore produces bacteria, it will release a toxin that suppresses motor neuron inhibition that is, the motor neuron continues to stimulate the muscle, and this results in sustained, terribly powerful contractions with a very high mortality rate. Botulism is food poisoning um, caused by improper canning. Clostridium botulinum is also found just about everywhere, so you have to know how to can properly. <clears throat> And as this organism's gr organism grows anaerobically inside the can, it's going to release a toxin that prevents the acetylcholine from being released, so you'd be paralyzed. And the, the, the uh, muscle you worry about is the diaphragm. If you paralyze the diaphragm, you stop breathing. And then myasthenia gravis is a progressive disease that destroys the acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate on the muscle fiber of a neuromuscular junction. Muscles uh, without ATP. Well, ATP pr production, look at this, requires nutrients and oxygen, but it requires life. Um, so once you die, you stop making ATP. However, there is ATP in your cells and um, cross bridges form 
and the muscles contract after death. And this is called rigor mortis. We need the ATP to release this, but you're dead. You're not making ATP. So it, when the cells start to decompose, the muscles will relax. It begins two to seven hours after death, lasts until one to six days after, and this certainly depends on the temperature. This is a completely different section of the book, um, a little more generic. Skeletal muscles are almost half our weight, and like the bones, it's, support, it's separated into the axial muscles and the appendicular muscles. Axial muscles support and position the axial skeleton, and appendicular muscles support, move, and brace our limbs. Some definitions where a skeletal muscle is attached that does not move, and that's called the fixed end, that is the origin. The move where the skeletal muscle attached to the movable end is the insertion. And the action is the specific movement of a skeletal muscle. Just a, a little thing here. So this muscle here crosses the elbow joint. And as the muscle gets shorter, and this part up here is not moving, this is what's moving. As the muscle gets shorter, it's going to pull the arm up. In this, in the previous case of the biceps brachii flexing the elbow, the biceps brachii is the agonist or prime mover. Um, brachioradialis is a muscle that, that assists the biceps brachii. That is, it helps it work and um, by performing the same function. That's the synergist. And, and the muscles work in pairs. The opposite of the agonist or prime mover is the antagonist. So if the agonist is the biceps brachii, the antagonist would be the triceps brachii. And there's our brachioradialis, a synergist that helps or assists the bicep brachii in contracting and uh, moving our elbow. So muscle names are kind of cool. Um, you don't have to memorize any of them, um, but their names tell you a lot about them. For example, it might be the region of the body. Um, fem fem femoris is thigh. How about um, ab abdominus, rec you know, rectus abdominis that's in the abdomen. If it has the word posterior or, or dorsal, it's going to be on the back part of the body. If, it's a, if it has the word bi, it tells you something about its origin. It has two heads. A triceps therefore has three heads. Sometimes it's a shape or size or action. Yes, memorize this whole chart. No, just pause here and look, look at it and you see some different names. Um, there are terms indicating action, extensor, depressor, abductor. We'll be talking about those actions. So we need to learn the actions of the muscles. Um, the actions are easy and often use words that you're familiar with in everyday life. So when you, I, I hate these definitions. Flexion is a movement that reduces angle between structures. So if you just stand there and you bend your elbow, bend your arm at the elbow, that is flexion. An extension is straightening up your arm. And hyperextension is going beyond anatomical position. If you are standing in anatomical position, your arms and legs are extended. Your head is extended. So in anatomical position, everything is extended. So if you move your leg forward, that is flexion. If you move your leg backward, 
that is hyperextension. Same with the head. Bend your head forward, it's flexion. Backward, it's hyperextension. If you move your whole arm forward, not, not flexing at the elbow, but lift your arm up straight at the shoulder, that's flexion of the arm. A dorsiflexion is when you point your toes or upward. So if you're trying to pick up a rock on the beach with your foot and you point your toes upward to flick that rock, that's dorsiflexion. Plantar flexion is what ballerinas do, pointing their toes downward. Here's some lateral flexion. Dorsi is up, plantar flexion is down. If you uh, steal a baby, you're abducting them. So abduction is movement away. So if you, well, I'll show a picture of abduction. So abduction is taking your arm and moving it away from the body. If you take your arm and move it towards the body, it's adduction. You can do the same with your wrist. This wrist is moving away from the body, abduction. So the hand moves away from the body, toward the body, adduction. Same with the leg. Take the leg away from the midline is abduct. So away is abduct. Adding together is adduct. You can ab and adduct your fingers. If you move your arm in a circle at the shoulder, it is called circumduction. Rotation, uh, don't worry about rotation. But she's rotating her arm there. I mean, it's clearly the head is rotating, but the arm, is, as she, she goes from anatomical position to moving the palms in the opposite direction, it's medial rotation. Um, here, if you um, hold your hand the way you would hold it if you were carrying soup with your palms upward is supination, palms downward is pronation. Opposition is what humans do with their thumb, able to move their thumb. So here's opposition. Um, you can move your the sole of your foot inward. That's called inversion. And you can move the sole of your foot outward. That's eversion. Lift your jaw. It's elevation. Drop your jaw. It's depression. So we have muscles of the cheek. And some of them elevate and some depress. So you can't say a muscle helps in chewing. It does help in chewing, but that's not describing the muscle. The muscle either elevates the jaw or depresses the jaw. And then you can move your jaw forward and backward, and that's called protraction and retraction. If you were to move your whole head forward, you're protracting your head, and you can move your whole head backward. Which of the following joints is not capable of abduction, adduction? Well, check this one out. Metacarpophalangeal or interphalangeal. Can you figure out where those joints are? So interphalangeal would be your fingers, the joints of your fingers, and metacarpophalangeal would be the joint from your hand to your finger. Which of the following movements is exclusive to the thumb and humans? That's opposition. Which of the following joints can perform inversion? The example we saw was the ankle. It's not the knee. <laughs> it's the ankle. <laughs> Which of the following is not included in circumduction? So think about moving that arm around in a circle at your shoulder joint. And that's rotation. Which of the following occurs at the jaw? Elevation, 